Well, welcome everybody. Again, my name is Richard Henschel. I'm a horticulture educator uh, in uh, Northern Illinois, um, outside of the Cook County area, uh, located in Kane County, which would be St. Charles, Geneva, Batavia, if you're a geographical kind of person and need to, need to know where it's, where it's uh, coming from. Um, and today's topic is about garden tool maintenance. And I hope I touch on a few things that uh, are not, the, not necessarily the run of the mill here. We all, of course, garden, or we hope we all get to garden. And in any gardening event, we pretty much have some sort of a gardening tool in our hand in the five gallon bucket we're carrying around with us. Um, maybe we're more sophisticated than that and actually have a tool pouch we carry around with all our good stuff in it. But there are certainly some general points here I wanted to make uh, related to gardening tools. And uh, the, the big point here is uh, any tool that you're using is going to function better for you if it is clean. More than that, it functions better for you if uh, uh, the blade or the or the uh, saw teeth are, are, are sharp. Uh, that just makes the job easier. I know some gardeners or homeowners in general just really hate to go out and prune because it's tedious, it's tiring. Uh, they end up with blisters on their hands, etc. And a lot of that can be taken back to the kind of tool you're using. Uh, is it sharp? Are you using the right tool for the right job? That kind of thing. So when we're talking about pruners, especially because they work basically with an anvil and a sharp blade, having those heads or blades uh, sharp and adjusted properly makes all the difference in the world. The only analogy that uh, might ring here for a lot of us is that if you've ever tried to cut a single sheet of paper with a pair of scissors that are not adjusted properly, it doesn't work. Well, these kinds of pruners, the bypass pruners work the same way. If it isn't adjusted properly, being able to get through that branch cleanly just doesn't really happen too, too well. Um, a lot of times we're pruning, we might be pruning in the canopy, but then on other times we're pruning uh, suckers, um, and which are coming from the, out of the ground near the base of a tree, for example, a crab apple or linden. Um, and that tip of that pruner gets into the dirt, then, then it's dirty and dirt does not uh, um, uh, really allow the pruners to function properly after a while. So making sure that we keep uh, the dirt off of the pruners, that they're sharpened and adjusted correctly um, really makes a difference. Um, when we come to other tools, like any of the tools that we uh, use in, to till the dirt with or dig a hole, uh, that soil can make a big difference on whether or not you enjoy using that shovel or spade and working in the garden or not. Uh, a bit of that holds true for even our gardening uh, weeding tools. So if you've got uh, long-handled pruners, for example, or long-handled shovels, shovels or spades that have wood handles, making sure they're nice and smooth and feel good to the touch is also important. No one wants to pick up a splinter or two some gardeners will go to the point of putting a, a wood preservative or a treatment on that open, wound, uh, open wood anyway, although they age quite nicely, even if you don't. And then the idea of uh, once you've sharpened something, you want to keep it sharp. And this is where uh, moisture and rust happen so quickly on new bare metal. So you want to clean the metal parts. You want to preserve uh, the new cutting edge and the, the, generally the blade as a whole. Um, so the surface needs to be dealt with so that you have a good, good tool, and good looking tool that functions properly the next time you go back. Uh, there can be, there's can be quite a bit of debate about uh, what you use to lubricate with. Um, I've suggested WD-40 as a product in the past and been told by machinists, well, that might work, but it's really not a true oil. Well, uh, my point in all of that is, uh, we're not talking about your car engine or the lawnmower engine. We're talking about a, uh, just a plain flat surface. And uh, WD-40 does a good job of um, keeping the moisture off that, off that metal surface. So WD-40 works. If you really want an oil, something like a three-in-one, some household oil, maybe something the equivalent of a, what's called a sewing machine oil works. The point is, if you're going to put those tools away, 
in late October, November in an unheated, unconditioned shed uh, or structure, um, there's an opportunity for moisture to collect and uh, start those things rusting. So whatever you wanna do, however you wanna handle it, you really wanna make sure that you don't see any uh, long-term rust or pitting happening uh, on those tools. In terms of getting the tools clean to begin with, uh, alcohol works, rubbing alcohol works usually very well for removing sap and we've all probably pruned a pine or two in our day and it's very sticky, very messy. Uh, we may have uh, been clipping out something as simple as milkweed and that leaves a gummy residue behind. So something like rubbing alcohol works really well for removing the sap. Um, if the concern is sanitation while we are doing this, then uh, a 10% bleach solution works very well. And then my, my caveat, and it's there in print for you to read, but um, bleach breaks down over time. And the, and the more dirt and debris you rub off uh, and leave in the solution with the bleach, the quicker it breaks down. So if you're gonna do a lot of cleaning or even routine sanitation while you're pruning, it's best to uh, renew that solution, say half of the way through the day, uh, so that the uh, Clorox does exactly what you want it to do, and that is to sanitize your tools. I talked about all sorts of pruners, and when it comes to hand pruners, um, if you're using them correctly, uh, you haven't done any mechanical damage to them, we're talking about either bypass or anvil type pruners. Um, these function the best because that sharp edge passes by the anvil or the other part of the handle on the other as you squeeze it together. Um, and they, again, will continue to work very well for a long, long time for you if we take care of them. So there is a pivot point and that needs to see a little lubricant once in a while. Um, we should, depending upon what they are, uh, typically, they're metal, sometimes uh, metal, oftentimes metal handles. Um, that could be aluminum. Um, I've seen them made out of zinc or magnesium. Uh, the point would be everything needs to be clean and, and comfortable to use uh, so that you're, so that again, you're kind of just really comfortable using the, using the, the, the pruner of choice here. And really important, these are all adjustable for tension on the head. So you can adjust these so that you do have a nice tight fit between the cutting head and the anvil on these tools. So take the time to do that. Um, the times I visit with homeowners and, and, and we're doing some demonstration perhaps and they bring out the gardening tools and, and the hand the hand pruner is horribly out of adjustment and when you find out what the, how they've been using it, that kind of explains it. Uh, if you can't cut the limb off using one hand on your hand pruner, you should move to a larger style pruner that provides you more leverage. Uh, otherwise you twist and tug and, and otherwise eventually uh, get that head so out of alignment that it, that it really won't cut anything properly any longer. So you really want to you use the right size tool for the branch you're really working on. So if we can't do it with the hand pruners, then we turn to things like loppers. Um, and, and here the choices again are both uh, wooden handled and metal handled loppers. Uh, the same thing applies. You wanna make sure the, the actual pruning head is, is clean and adjusted properly. Um, we all have a tendency to, when we're done pruning, you know, to move the branch out of the way, we may literally just kind of let go of the pruners and they land on the ground so that they get dirty and grimy in other ways, just not from the cutting head. So it's a good thing to keep them, keep them cleaned up. And these kinds of pruners will also have all sorts of plastic bits and parts that we hang on to and, and uh, use for leverage. So you want to make sure those plastic parts, again, are also clean. I know from time to time we're out there and it's starting to rain or there's dew on the ground yet and things are wet and we're in there and we can kind of get them a little muddied up. Well, it's good that when we're all finally done for the day that we clean these back up and put them away in a, in a, in a really in a, in a clean state. The one kind of tool I think that requires someone else, i.e. not us as homeowners, 
would be something like some of our, uh, our, our saws. This takes a kind of a special piece of equipment to set the teeth properly, to sharpen them properly. And there are a myriad of saws out there, whether they're the smaller uh, foldable, I'll, typically we call them a Japanese style saw or whether we have larger saws or we're using a good old fashioned bow saw here. Uh, they all need to be addressed. They all need to have their teeth sharpened in the set they're done properly. And that for the most part takes a, a professional blade saw sharpening outfit to do that for us. It's amazing, you know, when you cut with these in their, in their set properly and sharp, you actually get bits and pieces of wood coming off the blade. When they're not set properly, when the blades are dull, you get all this little kind of fine sawdust-like material. They're just not doing the job you want them to do for you, and it takes a whole lot longer for you to be able to cut through a branch, even a smaller branch. So it's, uh, so it's really worth it for... Uh, the time you're going to spend for the effort you have to expend to get a branch cut to make sure these uh, saws are, are really, really sharp. And when, when we're through, same kind of a thing applies. The, uh, the rubbing alcohol will remove sap. The WD-40 or other lubricant will keep the blade shiny. And uh, the way these things work most effectively is when they're clean, they pull through the branch very nicely. If they're gummed up, if they're rusty, uh, there's additional drag, which means there's more effort on your part to get the branch cut. So it's much more effective for you to have these, so these kinds of saws uh, sharp when you go to use them. We all have also have all sorts of our favorite tools, I'm sure. If, if there were 40 of us in a room, everyone would have a different favorite tool of theirs that they like to use. Um, the important parts here as has already kind of been gone through here, but you need to get the, get the dirt off, which helps keep the rust away. Uh, wooden handles again, no splinters and nice and smooth. If you've got tools like weeders and hoes and things like that, that have an actual sharpened edge to them, they need to be addressed uh, to maintain that sharpness. That's why they, that's why you can take your hoe and just kind of scrape it along the surface and scoop off those seedling weeds so easy. It's because you're doing that with a sharp edge uh, on, on the tool. So it's important to um, maintain that sharp edge. Um, and many of them are, uh, are, as you see here, short handled or there is no long handle on them. And um, again, you're right down there in the dirt with the tool. And that's why it's important to maintain uh, a degree of cleanliness as you go as you go through the season and certainly before they go into storage. The next group, and I kind of hit upon that earlier, but the next group that I kind of want to talk about here is the, uh, the whole idea of all your shovels and spades and and to some extent even potato forks and pitchforks. Um, uh, big wide rakes, things like that. Um, they need to be kept clean if they're going to function properly. Um, and when you get all done, you know, a, a decent uh, putty knife of some sort or the tool of your choice to get the initial lumps and clods of soil off is important. Uh, getting it down further with, say, a wire brush is the next step. Um, and uh, my favorite rough cloth, by the way, as it's here in the picture, is a good old-fashioned chunk of burlap. It's rough enough that it continues to uh, take down the, the dirt that the, uh, say, the wire brush has left. And then uh, if you need to, and I have pictures coming up here, if you really need to, uh, some sort of a wire wheel in a, in a portable drill, something like that, will uh, really get down to the metal. Um, so you get rid of all the dirt, you get rid of, for the most part, all the rust, and you, and then, then, then the next steps are, are, are easy. Along with wondering about all, getting all the dirt and debris off of them, this is the time when they should be sharpened if, if appropriate. If you go through and touch up a, a blade routinely throughout the season, it, it uh, stays sharp. It uh, maintains that, that uh, edge that you're looking for. And like all the rest, uh, after you've sharpened, you're talking about the uh, uh, oiling or the 
coat of some metal protectant on there for the long-term storage. And the other part about that is if we're wiping all this on with uh, paper toweling or an oily old rag, make sure you deal with those things in terms of disposing of them properly. They don't belong left out in the, out in the shed and, and they really don't belong somewhere where there's any chance of them becoming combustible. So when you're done, um, dispose of them properly so you don't have, to, don't have to worry about anything like that. One of the things that happens so easily is we're not necessarily in a hurry, but we're done gardening, maybe we're tired, uh, we're, we're finished for the afternoon and we're gonna get back to more planting later or we'll clean the shovel or spades up a little bit later on and we set them aside and there's some dirt, some debris left on. Well, the picture on the left is where we start. And even if you looked at the picture on the right, you can see that, that uh, even after we've uh, gotten the, the bulk of the dirt off, what we've left behind there is uh, rusty, is our rust spots on the blade. The soil maintains moisture in it. And, uh, and uh, that generally creates us an opportunity for rust to form because our shovels and tools of this nature, they're pretty much bare metal. And so they will rust relatively easy. So um as as much as you can when you get all done even if you only take the the rough rag across them and get the majority of the stuff off or use the putty knife and the rag get them as clean as you can uh even in between long-term storage so typically um uh, the tools of of choice here are going to be as i say maybe a putty knife to get the really big stuff off and then you can move to uh, a common wire brush readily available um, uh, for the bigger part of the blade. And if you've got tight cracks or crevices, they make smaller wire brushes. This one just happens to be a brass one. Um, I have seen folks use the same, not the same, <laughs> but I've seen them use the tools to, they use on their, on their barbecue grill to, to, to clean the grill. They'll use another one, um, uh, to to do that with to work with that with their shovels or their spades. So you have um, you have choices in how you get started with all of this. So I mentioned even after you've wire brushed, that's the picture on the left. Uh, you can still see the rust easy enough. And uh, the picture on the right has been after I've gone through this one with my burlap rag. And you can see it's a lot shinier, it's a lot cleaner, but yet you can still see the remnants of the uh, rust that was deposited around the neck because that soil had not been removed in a timely manner. So um, again, the, the point here, I guess, would be uh, timeliness is kind of important. You wanna be able to uh, really, um, it's so simple when you get all done, if you take the wire brush or the rag to it, before you put it away, that's the simplest way to deal with it because afterwards you've got a little more work to do um, uh, to get things back up to the way you, you really want your tools to look. Uh, they always want to be, you always want them to be sharp, but even a sharp tool with a bunch of rust on it and caked on dirt doesn't work as well as a sharp tool that's clean. Lots more effort has to go into digging the hole or, or running the spade down the side of the side of the hole when you're trying to enlarge it to plant a tree or a shrub, something like that. So you really want to uh, keep them as clean as possible. And obviously the sharpness is um, always something we should be conscious of. So here is the next simplest uh, method that I found anyway. Uh, this is just a simple wire wheel in the end of an electric drill. And in this case, I'm gonna share that it really needs to be an electric drill and not a battery operated drill because uh, the battery won't last very long when you're talking about using wire wheels. Um, so this is just a shovel that has been scraped, been rubbed with a rough cloth. And, and in the end, uh, the wire wheel has been used to get down to the bare metal again and, and make it reasonably smooth. Um, and this is the kind of the next step in getting the tool truly clean and, and ready to be uh, oiled and put in for long-term long storage over the winter time. Because we're talking about a wire wheel and an electric tool and all that, um, um, and there's a, some noise involved, you certainly want to protect your eyes and your hearing if you're going to use something like this.
here's just another tool that we all have in the garage. This is a, a flat spade. Uh, it's used for trenching. It's used for edging between the grass and the vegetable garden or the flower beds. And as you can see here, this edge is pretty well nicked and beat up. Uh, and we're just gonna quickly go through kind of how to salvage this and, and put this back in order. So besides all the cleaning and things that need this to happen on this, this certainly needs to be sharpened. So the, so the tools that are typically used pretty often for, for homeowners like you and myself are gonna be uh, uh, flat hand files. Um, and uh, this spade has just gone, been gone over with the hand file. Uh, I have a different perhaps attitude than some about getting rid of every nick on the blade. Um, they were put on that blade over time. You're gonna get rid of them over time because every time you go back and touch up the blade, a little more of that nick disappears. A little more of the metal will be worn away as you use it. So the nicks, will, the shallow nicks are going to go away over time. And I don't get too excited about seeing it. Overall, it's a very sharp blade. Uh, it's okay with me if there's a few nicks in it. I'm not that kind of perfectionist. There are things in the world that need to be perfect, but uh, a sharp spade or a sharp shovel, in my opinion, you know, is, isn't necessarily one of them. So here's a finished product. You can see it's been sharpened. It's had a, a wire wheel go across it. Although if you look close, you can see there up at the neck, there's still some rust, but that isn't the part of the blade that you're typically cutting with or digging down to. Uh, another time or two with the wire wheel would have, would have cleaned that up. This one's now ready for long time storage. Um, if that's what you're headed to, and it needs to be then uh, the metal surfaces need to be treated with oil any wooden handle needs to be clean and dry and, and smooth another garden tool that we don't think about so much perhaps that needs a little bit of care would be uh, wheelbarrows and garden carts uh, typically these guys have got some sort of a wheel on them and with that wheel comes a bearing that might be permanently uh, lubricated or no lubrication at all. Uh, some of them may or may not have a zerk fitting for grease. Uh, wheelbarrows wheels typically do. Some of our smaller two-wheeled garden carts probably don't. But the, so you need to address uh, wheel wheel bearings, um, grease them or oil them as as necessary or as needed. Um, you want to, if you're going to leave them outside for the winter time, typically you store them in, in, a, in a way that the wheel is off the ground and that the, the, the box itself isn't going to collect water uh, over the winter time. If that isn't possible, maybe there's a, a place where you pile up a whole bunch of garden stuff like this and you just tarp the whole pile uh, for the winter time. That's better than just leaving them set out in the elements. And if you're going to set them out in the elements, be sure that they're they're set so that the wheels off the ground uh, that prevent, by the way, that prevents the tire from freezing into the soil, which destroys the tire's integrity, uh, at which sometimes you'll find that uh, the tire becomes very weather checked and or will prematurely fail on you because the cords and things in the tire itself have rotted from being in constant contact with the soil over the seasons. Um, just like the rest, any bare metal surfaces ought to be treated. Maybe a touch up paint might be used. Um, any wood surfaces, uh, especially where you pick that handle up at the end of the handle with the wheelbarrows need to be nice and smooth. Uh, again, I've seen plenty of wheelbarrows where at least just the handle area is treated with a preservative to uh, maintain the smoothness uh, without it checking or cracking. And it should be put away with uh, air the tires properly inflated if they're not a, a pneumatic tire. Uh, and that helps preserve their lifetime for you. And um, if the tire isn't, you know, it's always nice to run, get the wheelbarrow, but you don't wanna have a flat tire on the wheelbarrow that just needs to be aired up before you do your task. So uh, keep things properly inflated and, and that's uh, always gonna be a benefit to you in the long run. Another area that often we don't think about as a garden tool, and I wanted to make sure we addressed it a bit here, is that uh, 
you know, your gardening hose, your garden hose is a tool of yours. You, uh, you know, this is a heck of a lot easier to use the garden hose than, than uh, a five gallon bucket and making five or six trips between the spigot and the plant you're trying to water. So a garden hose has not a lot of maintenance to it, but things like uh, the gaskets, the, the uh, rubber hose gaskets between the connections, between the spigot and the, and the hose, between hose to hose, that gasket needs to, be remain, needs to remain soft and pliable. Um, years back, they were just all out of rubber and held up pretty well, uh, but some of the newer materials are out of a plastic that hardens over time. So you may need to replace that gasket from time to time to, to keep the hoses from, from leaking substantially. Um, one of the other challenges I see as I walk the neighborhoods and, and look about is uh, people know that they have a frost proof spigot on the house, but in order for that frost proof spigot to not be damaged, the, the water has to be able to drain out of the spigot. And I see a lot of garden hoses attached all winter long to the house spigot. So they might get by without a plumbing problem for a while, but eventually um, they may have a, a repair bill come spring when the water starts to leak into the house from a, from a frozen, uh, busted up, uh, frost free spigot. So just not, not quite a word of warning, but something just to kind of remember. Um, also, when you leave uh, water in the hose, um, it freezes and thaws throughout the season, and in, technically here garden hoses aren't really designed to be frozen full of water. They survive, but their, their ability to last and have elasticity over the years uh, certainly is degraded, uh, and you'll find yourself maybe replacing the hose a little bit before you thought you would have to, or in the summertime, you're using a, a nozzle attachment and you turn the water off at the nozzle, pull, left the spigot on and find yourself with a ruptured hose uh, the next morning or water spraying somewhere it wasn't intended to be. Well, that's because of the long-term degradation on the integrity side of that, that garden hose. Um, so the, I think the more important thing is get the hose off the house so that you don't have any freezing spigots, but drain the water out, coil them up, set them in the garden shed out of the way, uh, and you'll be and you'll be good to go for the next season. Next area I wanted to talk about, and and it's I'm considering this a a garden tool in the sense that virtually unless you have a turf free yard, everyone has a lawnmower of some sort, um, and um, there certainly depends on how you look at it anyway, they're certainly an improvement over the way we used to have to mow our lawns. Um, but yet these, these are machines, um, they require some maintenance uh, and how well you take care of them uh, will, will determine how long they last for you um, in, in, in your yard. And the, the, I, I think one of the biggest points I wanna share is, you know, these are uh, engines that use gas and oil and they turn it in excess of 2000 revolutions per minute. That means every minute you're pushing it, that blade is circled underneath the deck 2000 plus times. So you can imagine it doesn't take that long for the mower blade itself to get dull. Um, and and uh, that is also then a function of how often we're going to really, or should be uh, touching up or sharpening that blade. A sharp blade just makes our lawn look amazingly better. Um, a sharp blade uh, actually helps cut the grass blade off rather than tug and shred it. So that's again, uh, to the benefit of the lawn in terms of appearance. It's also to the benefit of the lawn for um, helping the lawn resist lawn diseases because that shredded grass tip is just a, a wide open door for uh, pathogens to move in. So we really want that sharp mower blade. Um, we have from time to time, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, run into some rocks, run into some heavy twigs, maybe hit the curb, or more oftentimes maybe the downspout uh, 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 cement block. Um, and these things will absolutely, when the blade is going 2,000 plus revolutions per minute, 
dull the blade up extremely quickly and or give you some pretty good nicks and gouges in the blade. Um, none of those are going to help the lawn look better. Um, and when we go to sharpen them, those nicks and gouges uh, are going to present a, an, another challenge as well. So we really want to maintain uh, the lawnmower, the part of the lawnmower that comes in immediate contact with the grass blades, i.e. the lawnmower blade, sharp as often as and as much as we can. Um, the, the typical suggestions I always share would be, you know, you want to do it in the spring and then about halfway through the summer, you want to do it again and that'll hold you till fall. And then if we're in a situation where uh, we're also mulching up the dropped leaves from the trees and shrubs in our yard. Um, that is a semi abrasive activity in terms of that lawnmower blade. So by the time the season's over with, you should sharpen that lawnmower blade again so that you're all ready to go for the following spring. But in terms of actual sharpening the blade and and now this is this these next few slides might seem rather rudimentary. Uh, and obvious, there's a lot of new homeowners that are unfamiliar with how to do this or that they even should be doing this. So as, as uh, we, we move forward here, uh, these are relatively quick, a few quick slides, but you'll get, you'll get the idea and maybe you can help a neighbor figure out how to sharpen their mower blade uh, uh, quickly and, and, and safely as well. For starters, you wanna make sure that the spark plug comes uh, wire comes off the spark plug and pulled or set aside so there's absolutely no way inadvertently uh, we can have a spark go from the, uh, uh, the spark plug wire to the spark plug itself. You want to make sure that that cannot, cannot happen. Uh, typically we want to do this before we mow so that we don't have a hot muffler to worry about uh, or if we do want to do it after we mow then wait an hour and let the let the engine cool down so the, the muffler isn't uh, scalding hot. So we've undone the spark, we've taken the spark plug wire off, which is the first step, but then you have to manage trying to take the bolt off uh, without the engine turning. And that's where in this case, this is a two by chunk of two by two lumber, but a large branch would, or a piece of a branch would work just as well you want to use a pretty good long handled wrench if you can, if you have it, because you need the leverage because that uh, lawnmower bolt that holds the mower, the mower blade on is, is pretty well on there and, and it could be grimed up and, and dirty as well. And that doesn't help it come loose. So you need something with a handle on it to help break that bolt loose. Uh, sometimes a uh, socket and a socket wrench is what you can use. Something to give you a little more leverage would be the would be the key here. So that blades come off, and 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 I don't think well. I think a lot of folks will be surprised when they actually take a look at it. it from a glance, it looks sharp, but if you take a close up view of it, like you've got here you can see that the cutting edge is absolutely already rounded over. It's like a butter knife at the kitchen table. There is no sharpness to this. And this kind of a blade doesn't cut the grass. It just kind of shreds it and, and pulls it off. Uh, not the healthiest um, cut when you're all done. Uh, and you can also see while this blade doesn't look like it's run into the uh, downspout concrete or the curb or a rock in the yard somewhere, uh, there are a few little nicks and dings in the blade. And as I mentioned, I don't have issues with a couple, three little ones left over after you're done um, because eventually you'll be able, they will disappear and you'll be able to uh, file them out as you continue to uh, uh, sharpen the blade. So if we're talking about doing it by hand and if you've got uh, a blade that's sharp when you start and you don't wait till it's horribly dull, then you have the option of uh, doing it by hand and the tools of choice would be some, some gloves, some, uh, some hand protection, and then a decent uh, file. And the rulers there just for size comparison, something to uh, uh, compare what I'm talking about to. So, and if you have a couple files, the better, if you have a more of a coarse one and more of a fine one, um, that helps get the job done a bit quicker.
one thing I do want to stress is when whatever, however you're going to sharpen these, you want to make sure that you have a very strong, secure surface, something that's at a good working height, because you are applying a fair amount of pressure with the file to the blade to get the filings to come off. And uh, you don't want things slipping. Um, you want to have a good stance for yourself so that you feel comfortable about putting the pressure onto the blade as you sharpen it. So whether, uh, so whether or not you happen to be lucky enough to maybe to have a bench vise or you've got a work made or a workshop kind of a table that you can clamp the blade to, you just want to do it so that it's very secure and you're comfortable uh, with, the, with the next steps. So here's the blade. This one happens to be in the vise. Um, you want to take advantage of the length of the file and long, even strokes, good, strong pressure. And you can see that the file has begun to take off the older surfaces and begin to leave you a new shiny surface with a much sharper edge to it. Uh, this, is what you're, this is what you're looking for. Um, the longer that angle on the blade, the longer the blade will stay sharp once you're done. So it's important to keep the angle relatively low as you sharpen. Um, and again, that, that will be to your advantage as well, besides using long, slow strokes. So here's a few minutes into it. You can see that the the hand file has done its job. You're beginning to see a good strong edge. Uh, the nicks are for the most part out of there now. There's a couple tiny ones left. Um, and, and as I mentioned, if you've got a couple different kind of file sizes in terms of uh, uh, a coarse one and a fine one, use the coarse one first and finish off with a fine one to get yourself a nice final edge. Uh, that's the, the best way to do it. But even if you only have a file, that this you'll get the job done. It's just a matter of of, uh, of time. And the longer it's been since it's been sharpened, the longer it will take you to get it resharpened again. So more frequently is better than uh, rarely or seldom, I guess is the point I would like to share here. Another way we can get the blade sharpened is uh, uh, with a grinder. This is a simple handheld um, uh, Dremel tool style uh, with, a, with a grinding blade in it. Uh, if you've got, if you fear that uh, the job is just too big to do by hand, this is a great way to start. You can finish it off with the hand file, by the way. You just don't have to stop with this, but it's a, it's a way to take a little more metal off, uh, a little easier with the hand tool. This is there, again, there's a risk here. So eye protection, ear protection, uh, it's necessary. You're still wearing gloves in all of this. Um, and the bigger that uh, grinding wheel is, uh, the better the angle. The uh, bigger wheel will give you that longer angle that you really want on, on the blade. And you take a few passes, you pull the grinder away, you have a look, and you go after it again until you can make long, solid passes all the way along the blade that seem to be nice and clean and, and uniform. So here's a, a finished blade, if you will. This is one after the grinder has been used. So you can see it doesn't have an absolutely clean finish to it like you get with a file. And yet the, the edge is certainly there. You can still see there's a couple of little nicks in it. And as I mentioned, I think that's perfectly fine. If you take your blades to a uh, sharpening um, store, a professional uh, sh sharpening outlet, um, you'll get it back and there will be absolutely no nicks in it. They will, have all, uh, they will also have taken off a little more metal uh, to get the nicks out of there before they give it back to you. So over time, over years, your, your, your blade will eventually get a lot thinner looking here at the end. Um, and, that may, and that might uh, indicate it's maybe a time for a new blade eventually. But again, by hand, it'll last you probably the length of the time you own the lawnmower. Well, you've cleaned the blade, you've sharpened the blade, uh, and it's time to put the blade back on. And just remember uh, that it is a very sharp tool at this point. And you don't want to slip with the wrench, uh, come in contact with the sharp edge. So we're talking about using that same chunk of wood 
we're reversing the direction of the threads, of course, we're putting it on at this point. Um, the, um, if, there's, if this is a tip, uh, I have uh, been in yards and looked at the grass and it's looked terrible. And I've examined the lawnmower and the lawnmower blade is perfectly sharp. Uh, it was just been put on backwards. So when you put them on the wrong way, uh, the dull edge of the blade is what's shredding up the lawn and, and, not, and you're not cutting it. Most of the new mowers today, the, the blade is manufactured in a way that's pretty much impossible for you to do that. But it can still happen from time to time if you're not paying attention. So that's just a, a sidebar a little bit. Just make sure you've got the blade on the mower oriented properly before you secure it. Couple three things that really didn't fit into um, a slide, if you will. If you have found out you've damaged, uh, heavily damaged or bent the blade, and, and that's important. Um, and, and I say you, it might be somebody else in the family. I'll just say the, the blade's been bent. Um, you need to replace that and then recycle the old blade probably, uh, properly. Um, one of the arguments, and I'll call it that, that, that I hear all the time is, well, if I take the blade off and send it out to be sharpened, I may not get it back in time uh, to mow the lawn when it's ready. Well, the easy solution is just own two lawnmower blades. You know, lawnmowers cost these days several hundred dollars. Um, so I don't think the cost of a second blade is really uh, going to break the bank in the long run. Uh, and if you have two blades, then it's simple. One comes off, one goes back on, you're ready to mow the lawn the next time with, on your schedule, and you don't have to worry about getting that lawnmower blade back, and then, and then just cycle again the next time it's, it's there. And the, the final tip, if you will, is if that blade is really worn, um, you know, you ought to have it consider, you ought to consider having it professionally sharpened and balanced. That's where the balancing comes in. Uh, Blades that are, that are badly damaged or bent and blades that are woefully out of balance cause the lawnmower to shake and shimmy around. Uh, you prematurely wear out the engine bearings, actually, um, and you won't get the kind of nice cut lawn that you were hoping for if either one of those things occur. So this is just a, a, a bit more about what you might consider doing uh, with, with your lawnmower blades as you... As you uh, um, use it, use the mower throughout the season. One of the other parts that's just impo as important as that lawnmower blade is, um, is making sure your, your lawnmower deck is uh, level um, and, and not crooked. Uh, the lawn will have a, a very odd look to it if you use a, a, a mower that the wheels are not set up properly. Uh, you just want to make sure that the mower deck is even on all four corners and, and regardless of what the measurement says or what the click is on the mower wheel, uh, the, the deck needs to be level. So disregard the one, two, three, four or the notches if indeed uh, that's what it takes in order to have a, uh, a squared up uh, mower deck. Um, mowers, whether they're self-propelled or push or, or a rider, um, they all have, of course, wheels and bearings, and they all need to be addressed properly, either with grease or oil. Uh, additionally, some of our um, self-propelled walk-behind mowers have a zerk fitting, a grease fitting um, in the drive mechanism that needs just a little bit of grease once a year, um, and that'll keep uh, the uh, drive mechanism from uh, uh, drying out and, and ruining the gears and things like that. So you want to you want to make sure if there's a grease fitting, make sure you get some grease in it. Uh, make sure you either oil or grease the wheels. It depends upon what the riders may often have a grease fitting for the wheels. Walk behinds and self propels may not, but they they have a a bushing that still needs to have some oil on it once in a while. So those are just things that make the job easier. If you have a uh, you don't have a self-propelled lawnmower and the wheels don't spin freely, that's extra effort on your part to push that lawnmower through the yard. 
So again, I'm, I'm all about making it easier for you uh, or in all of us to uh, um, do the gardening that we have to do and the lawn yard work that we have to do as, as, as easy as possible. Of course, when we're all done, uh, just remember to reattach the spark plug. Uh, this is, that sounds so basic and yet um, that can happen uh, and does. Some of the additional things that I didn't put a whole bunch of slide, individual slides together on, but one of the things that makes our lawnmower engine start and perform their best is replacing the spark plug. Uh, lawnmower won't start, change the spark plug first before you send it off to the repair shop. A lot of times that's the difference between starting and not starting. Um, the other thing that we don't think about, but it's out there is, you know, that air filter with an engine that turns 2000 plus RPMs a minute, the air filter is sucking in a lot of air for combustion. And with it comes dirt, grit, debris. When we're mulching up leaves in the fall, that generates this cloud of leaf dust, if you will, around and all that gets sucked into the air filter. So cleaning the air filter, replacing the air filter is something that should be done routinely. And to protect the fuel system throughout the wintertime, especially if since lawnmowers still are running with good old fashioned carburetors, is fresh gas, a little bit of gas stabilizer, running the mower for, for a three, four, five minutes to make sure that that gas from the tank makes it all the way through the engine, all the way through the carburetor. So you've protected all those parts for the winter time. That's important. And then, although they don't make it easy anymore, we still should be changing the oil at least once a year on our lawnmowers. Uh, older lawnmowers actually used to have a drain plug. A lot of the newer mowers do not. You have to kind of turn the lawnmower on its side or upside down and the waste oil comes out of the oil fill hole. Uh, and then the same thing should happen here. Clean oil goes in, you should run the engine to make sure the clean oil circulates and lubricates all the parts before you put it away for the winter time. So those are the, I guess, the quick and, and dirty parts I wanted to share today about lawn care, uh, about tool maintenance for the season. Um, it wasn't a wasn't intended to be a, a, a completely lengthy kind of a presentation, but I wanted to hit some of the tools I thought that may have may be neglected or and or shouldn't be neglected throughout the throughout the uh, the growing season that we deal with. Uh, 